First little introduction. Uh, my name's Alex Benet. I'm a senior engineer at Lenara's virtualization team. Uh, you can find me on the Quemu channel as ST Squad, and you can find me on the Lenara channels as AJP Lenara. Um, I mostly work on ARM emulation, but I have been known to do a little bit of KVM on the side. And for my sins, I'm also an Emacs user. So let's start by defining what we mean by multi-threaded TCG. TCG simply stands for the tiny code generator. And it's basically used as a shorthand uh, for when you're using QEMU to do cross-processor virtualization. So running code for one instruction set on a machine that supports another. Currently, QEMU supports around uh, 16 families of processors. So unlike KVM, the TCG variant of QEMU has only one thread for all its emulated vCPUs uh, on a system. So this means the execution engine runs each vCPU on turn. The result looks a little something like this. So this is a single core on my eight core machine spinning away frantically as it tries to emulate a four core ARM system. So this is obviously quite a massive waste of resources. So when we talk about multi-threaded TCG, we envisage a process model that looks a little bit more like this. So here, we're basically referring to the relatively simple change of making each vCPU run uh, on a different thread. So in an ideal world, uh, each vCPU thread will be distributed to an individual core, maximizing the performance of your emulation. Uh, in practice, the reality might be a little bit more chaotic. So let's talk a little about why we want to do this. Well, part of the answer is we're living in a multi-core world. This is the Humble Raspberry Pi, and it's sold around about 5 million units since its launch in 2012. The current iteration has four cores, just running under a gigahertz each, and the whole thing is available for $25. Of course, the Pi is only a 32-bit toy machine. This is the Dragon Board, which is a commercially available 64-bit ARM system. Uh, it's designed for prototyping, and it provides a Snapdragon-powered quad-core, uh, Cortex-A53, and it's available for $75. Even the phone in my pocket is a multi-core device. Um, the Nexus 5 has a quad-core crate running at 2.26 gigahertz, and that looks faintly underpowered compared to some of the uh, phones coming out this year, which have 64-bit octo-cores. Of course, it's not just about the devices that we're emulating. My desktop is a fairly modest i7, which I bought when I joined Lenaro. It has four real cores with another four fake ones and costs around about $600. In the end, I spent more on the RAM than I did on the processor. And if you're prepared to spend a few thousand dollars, you can get something like this monster, which has uh, two Intel Xenons in it, six plus six cores and is used for building Android images. It would be nice if we could get this to run at uh, reasonable speed when testing those images. While we're on the subject of Android, uh, as some of you may know, the Android emulator is based on QEMU. In fact, we did some significant work last year updating the Android emulator to the latest QEMU code base for the ARH64. Uh, and supporting the emulator is uh, one of our key use cases. So while the last few decades have seen a fairly phenomenal growth in processing, as Moore's law has held true, we're starting to see the growth in single core performance starting to tail off. So while embarrassingly parallel problems can quickly take advantage of all the multiple cores, uh, the problem for emulation is a little bit more complex. Uh, other than performance, there are a few other reasons to care about this. Multi-threaded TCG would behave more like a real system. So while you have all your vCPUs sitting on a single thread, there are behaviors that you won't get compared to real systems. So what you really want um, is if you have flawed software, you really want to see your concurrency issues show up uh, whilst you're doing your emulation on your bring up, rather than by the time you get your real hardware. Um, as QEMU is a dynamic emulation, there are also other things you can do which are harder 
uh, in real hardware. So you can add additional instrumentation to investigate behavior, and there are also some fancy tricks like record and playback um, and reverse debugging that can be done. Again, you want a system that behaves more like the system that it's emulating. Uh, one of the other use case, common use cases for QEMU is cross-tooling. Now, I've been a developer, I've spent quite a lot of time building uh, things in the non-x86 world, so I'm fairly familiar with building uh, cross-compilers. The process has become easier over the years, but there's still a lot of inherent complexity. Uh, sometimes this can be addressed by using Linux user emulation, but that's not without its warts. Uh, after you've spent time messing around getting your bin format mess set up, making sure you have multi-lib or using cheroots. You can still get stymied if uh, threads get overly complex or signals are used. So what I really want is I just want to be able to boot up my ARM development system on my desktop and get all the usual tools and get on with it. So there are two main areas that we need to address when we talk about multi-threaded uh, TCG. We need to worry about global state in QEMU and then we also look at, need to look at how the guest memory is modeled. So first and foremost obvious thing is uh, global state. So there are numerous globals involved in the TCG generation. Um, there are also a number of runtime structures that the TCG code needs to access. And while some are private to each vCPU, there are system operations like remapping memory that can affect all of the vCPUs. And finally, there are all the structures associated with device emulation. The other area that needs attention is guest memory behavior. So while you have all your vCPU sh scheduled uh, sequentially, there's a lot of uh, system behavior that is automatically conformant. So as soon as you have threads running across multiple CPUs, you need to take special care to ensure that you have the correct memory semantics. Um, so this is important for both atomic behavior and load link store conditional semantics, but also memory consistency <coughs> and memory ordering. So uh, the, there is a challenge with uh, having load store orders that are usually only consistent for the CPU that you're running on. Uh, and in the current case, without multi-threading, that's okay. As soon as you split that up, you need to make sure that you model memory barriers properly. So let's look at a couple of the ways we can approach this problem. There are three broad approaches um, we can take. The classic approach is to split everything into threads and apply mutexes around any shared infrastructure. However, you have to take care because it's easy to get into situations where you can get deadlocks. Or if you add so many locks that lock contention is very high, so high that the system spends all its time thrashing around. Another approach is to accept the limitations of QEMU's TCG emulation and contain them in multiple processes, each worrying about emulating a single core. So this diagram comes from a project called CoreMU, which is a research project that uses the QEMU code base. Um, and it has an arbitration middle layer, this CoreMU library. Uh, and it uses uh, IPC and shared memory. So each instance of QEMU is running in its own separate process. So there are variants of this design that are sometimes used when you're using QEMU with um, functional FPGA simulators. Uh, finally, you, can accept, you could accept that the uh, original design assumptions are incompatible and rewrite everything from scratch because you obviously know, having come across these problems before, you'll get everything right the second time. So while the classic threads and locks approach should give you the highest performance, you still have to be careful with your locking str uh, strategy, and it can get quite complex. <coughs> Having a separate process, uh, separate process per vCPU makes it easier to get correct behavior, but this can involve quite invasive remodeling of the code, and performance can be an issue. Um, while it's often tempting to rewrite uh, the thing, remember you, you have to remember the QEMU code base has almost a million lines of code in it. Um, slot count estimates about 260 person years of effort have gone into the code base so far, and that would be an awful lot of wasted legacy. So let's look at what we've done. So the current work uh, with the existing code uh, works with the existing code base, um, but it tries to minimize the number of locks 
uh, it, uh, involved to avoid exploding complexity. The run loop has been mostly serialized, but the execution of the translated code itself is fully multi-threaded. So at the same time, we've also added some new memory semantics uh, to deal with uh, properly emulating some of the guest memory behavior. And finally, there's support for multi-threaded device emulation. So let's remind ourselves, the first thing we've got to deal with is global state in Quemu. So the major challenge is the code generator itself. There are a large number of uh, per-file static variables which are used in the code generation path. Uh, these are usually used to store temporary references, things like that. So if two threads attempt to generate code at the same time and hit the shared variable, you're going to get problems. Outside of the code generator, there are the wider um, system structures that are used whilst the code is running. So this includes a, a soft MMU TLV, which is used for all our memory emulation, uh, which needs to be updated when you change things like page mappings. Uh, there's also a jump cache, which is used for hooking between, uh, jumping between translation, uh, translated code blocks. And there are also a couple of condition flags and uh, variables. So the condition variables and flags are fairly simple to make per vCPU. Um, so this includes a, a whole conditional that allows you to um, block the vCPU on a pending, usually pending I.O. work, and an exit request flag that you can use to signal the vCPU to exit. Say, for example, you need to process an interrupt. So seeing as I've uh, mentioned basic blocks, let's just quickly remind ourselves of how TCG works. The process is fairly simple. Um, on demand, we take a block of machine code for the target and convert it into an intermediate form. And then from this, the final jitted code is generated. So here's some simple input machine code. Um, we have a very simple subroutine that takes, two, uh, takes uh, a number, adds one to it, and stores it back. Uh, the branch returns uh, signals the end of a basic block. So although in this case it's an unconditional return, um, this will end the current input block. So this includes any uh, conditional branches or computer jumps. The code is then broken down into a bunch of intermediate representations which are known as TCG ops. So these are similar to the sort of thing that a compiler would generate, uh, sort of an intermediate representation. And then we go through a basic optimization phase where we do things like remove dead assignments and propagate constants, that sort of thing. And then finally, we output binary code suitable for running on the host. So this example has been simplified somewhat because I'm saving the details of the soft MMU for later. <coughs> the final code is wrapped into a basic block which consists of a short piece of prolog code, the translated code, and then we have up to two possible exit paths. So in this, uh, in this example, we'll never use the second exit path. Finally, as the code runs, the blocks are chained together to jump directly to each other. Um, there are some complications. This only occurs when the blocks are in the same physical page because you, you don't want to jump out of a, a page that might have been remapped. So if we just remind ourselves of what global state we need to worry about. We have a bunch of globals that are used during code generation, and we have some global runtime structures which any VCP may affect. Fundamentally, the translated code is safe when we're doing simple computation, because it only affects um, the VCPU's internal state, so that particular instance of the CPU's registers, that sort of thing. So this means we only really need to worry about protecting things when we leave the generated code. So let's look at a couple of reasons why that might happen. So the two cases I'm going to look at now are returning to the main run loop and calling a helper function. So there are two principal exit paths to the run loop. Uh, the first is when you don't have the next block patched and you come to an exit and it's, it's not got to jump uh, to another block. It goes straight back to the run loop. And this is usually because you haven't generated the block yet, so you need to call the code generator to generate the code or the other case is the page boundary cro crossing. The second case is when the vCPU has been signaled to exit, uh, and this is where it 
picks it up through the prolog, where it checks the exit flag each, uh, each time it goes into a basic block. And if the exit flag is set it, uh, set, it comes back out to the run loop. There is also actually a third way of doing this. You can asynchronously exit the run loop um, by sending a signal in, but usually this is only for things like debugging. So this shows a simplified version of the run loop. At, at the core, you can see um, you start in the run loop, you find the block you want to run. If you can't find the block, you generate the code, add it to the code buffer, and then you go start and uh, jump into the translated code, and the tr code keeps running until it comes to an exit. You come back out and go back round. So as the code generation involves a lot of global state, uh, what we have here um, in the generate code is present, uh, protected by a translation lock. So this basically means we've serialized all the code generation. This solves the problem of all the um, globals in the code generator. Uh, the other reason we can exit the code is if we're executing helper functions. So helper functions are called directly from the translated code, and they can be uh, called for, do, for a number of reasons. Uh, often they're called to do things that are a little too fiddly with TCG ops. So for example, most of our SIMD and floating point code is done with helper functions. Um, but we also have a number of uh, instru instructions that will have an effect on system state. So these <coughs> tend to be things like TLB flushes and other system maintenance instructions. So the first case is fairly simple. As long as the results are private to the vCPU, you don't need any locking. Um, if the results affect the status of other vCPUs, we need to think about using locking. Um, however, in some cases, there will be operations that will affect all of the vCPUs. Question. Yes. Do you consider live C in those other lives like that to be a helper function, or is there, are they actually translated into the basic blocks when you call them? So are you talking about the guests libc? That's just code that gets translated. So it's from, a, from a system emulation point of view, we translate it all. You translate it all. You don't try to use the targets live C. No, no. Uh, right. So one approach we could use is to protect structures uh, in the vCPU um, reads with locks, but this quickly gets very complicated uh, and also kills performance. So another approach is if you can make sure that all the vCPUs have halted and then you can make the changes safe in the knowledge that nothing else is accessing the data. So for this we use um, a deferred work mechanism. Now, Cremio actually already has a deferred work system. Um, work can be added to a queue and then the vCPU is signaled to stop and then once it exits the run loop, it will process the work. And the multi-threaded work has introduced the concept of a new safe work queue. Uh, and this works pretty much the same way except all the vCPUs have halted before the safe work is carried out. So this is useful for system-wide events. So if you, again, TLB flushes the often quoted example, um, once all the vCPUs have come to a halt, you can then change all the memory mappings and everything's okay. So in summary, for the TCG, um, we've had to move some variables into per vCPU thread uh, structures. We've used a translation lock that serializes all of our code generation. And this also actually protects all the manipulation of the jump cache and other um, mechanisms for uh, maintaining the links between the translated blocks. And then finally, we've added a asynchronous work mechanism that allows us to defer tasks until the vCPUs are halted. So let's look at the way that the memory behaves in emulation. So the current TCG doesn't offer any atomic primitives. So as a result, the actual code generated for pretty much any atomic operation will be a load store pair inside a basic block. With the current single-threaded behavior, basic blocks are always completed before the next vCPU is scheduled. So this means that load modify store sequences are automatically atomic, because uh, no other core can be running at the same time. So even on a weekly ordered system, loads and stores still load, uh, honor the program order for the CPU that they're actually running on. Once multiple threads are involved, 
each potentially running on a different CPU, all these assumptions break down. So code which worked thanks to your implied atomicity um, will start to break down. Uh, memory ordering also becomes an issue, although in the case of running on x86, which is the common back end, uh, this is generally masked because of the x86 this is uh, strong memory ordering. Um, and of course, well-written guests will be using processor features to mitigate these effects. So let's look at one of them. Uh, load link store conditional is, uh, are a pair of instructions that are common on uh, risk architectures with load store architecture. Uh, this is in contrast to something like compare and swap, which people on using x86 may be familiar with, which does a load modify store in one instruction. So the important thing is the store will only succeed if the address that's been loaded for, from earlier hasn't been touched by any other CPU in the system, uh, even if the value remains the same. <coughs> so introducing proper load link store conditional semantics into Quemu is important to be able to model both load store exclusive and atomic instructions. And we have to be able to do this in a way that doesn't rely on any intrinsic backend uh, facilities because we have a multiplicity of backends for the code generator. So the first step is we introduced a couple of new TCG ops for load link and uh, conditional store. So before we go further, I'm just gonna do a quick reminder of how the soft MMU works so, and talk about its implementation. So the soft FMU is responsible for mapping all of the memory access to real memory on the host. So the mapping is done by adding a simple offset to the um, guest address, which will then point to a real address in Quemu's address space. Um, all of this has a fast path, which is all done in the generated code. Um, and, the fast, uh, and then we also have a slow path, which returns to the C code uh, and eventually ends up doing a walk of the appropriate um, system page tables. So I've, I've broken it down into three stages here. So uh, each access to memory uh, ha carries a number of attributes. So we've got the address itself, the guest address, an MMU index, uh, and an access type. So the MMU index uh, isn't actually directly related to privilege levels, uh, but to which memory translation regime we're following. So there are, for example, uh, memory man uh, MMU modes that allow you to view the kernel and user space, address space at the same time. Given the right MMU table, we then generate an index into the TLB. So the size of each entry um, is driven by the number of MMU modes we have, but it will at least be an 8-bit uh, index table. And finally, we get the target page of the guest address is uh, masked out and compared with the appropriate entry uh, in the TLB entry. And if it matches, the offset can be added straight away. Uh, if not, the slow path is triggered. Now, if you notice, we have a number of uh, bits uh, flags at the bottom of these addresses. Uh, those, this allows even a mapped entry to force the slow path. <coughs> so how does this all help with load link store conditionals? So we've already added uh, TCG ops. And then we can use the soft MMU slow path to implement in a back-end generic way, um, the semantics we want. I've got a diagram that shows it here. <clears throat> so what happens is when you do uh, execute a load link um, operation on an address, the TLB entry has uh, a bit set in the flags, and that means that any other access to memory through that TLB entry will come through the slow path. So in an uncontended case, you do the load link, the store conditional will go through the slow path, the flag will be un unmolested, the store conditional will succeed and you get your result. And then once the, um, that's been done, reads and writes will still happen as normal in the fast path. In the contended case, you do your load link, the flag gets set, and then another CPU attempts to do a write. Because the flag is set in the TLB entry, it has to go through the slow path. Once it comes through the slow path, it flips the flag, uh, so it's no longer exclusive. And then when the store conditional on the first CPU runs, uh, it knows that something else has touched that memory area, and the store conditional will fail. Yeah.
there. Uh, so the microphone. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so yes, if the thread on the right it touch another part of the of the memory which was not uh, low stored by the left uh, by the left thread, is that okay? Uh, will that also trigger the uh, store failure? Uh, so as long as it's not the same uh, TLB entry, it okay. will be fine. It can still do fast path and everything's fine. Okay. So it's only when it's accessing something that's in the same region that that TLB entry accesses. Now, the regions that the TLB entry covers are bigger than the regions that are covered uh, in, a, in a, I think usually it's a cache line or an implementation defined um, area that is protected by the um, load link. Um, thing. So, yes, there is a chance for higher contention there. So, I, I'm so surprised. Why don't you have a TLB per C, virtual CPU slash thread? Because that's more like the, what the real hardware is going to do. Oh, sorry, yes, I should be clear. There is a TLB for each uh, vCPU, so you, you need to set all the TLB entries. Um, well, so there are two things, right? So if the TLB is pointing at a page that is uh, not affected, they'll continue on as per normal. It's only when uh, you uh, are accessing the page that has been set as exclusive that that will get loaded in and then the flag will be set. So it's fairly lightweight as long as there's no contention in the same memory area. So yes, I think we've covered that. In, in summary, there's a new uh, TLB exclusive flag. Uh, all accesses that in the same memory area will follow the sl uh, slow path and trip the flag, and store conditional will always follow the slow path. And if the flag has been tripped, it can signal a fail. So in summary, the soft MMU offers a fairly efficient way to map guest memory into the host. At the same time, it provides an effective way of, which, uh, of trapping access to certain regions of memory, which can be useful for many things, but in our case, for load link store conditional support that doesn't overly burden normal memory accesses. Memory barriers, however, are still an issue. Uh, finally, let's have a quick look at device emulation. So as uh, KVM's model very much relies on having a thread per vCPU, they, they already had to add thread safety into an awful lot of the uh, subsystems of Quemu. So this include add, included added, uh, this included adding a better defined uh, memory API, so access to emulated devices can be um, properly serialized with locks. And the other big change was the introduction of an I.O. thread, which involved separating the handling of I.O. from the rest of the system. So in the TCG world, device emulation works through the soft MMU TLB pages. And there's another flag, TLB MMIO, uh, which will force a slow path for each access. Um, access to MMIO regions go through the memory API. And the memory API defines the region of memory as either being lockless or being locked with the BQL. So in the common case, locked with the BQL, that means any access to an emulated device will basically be serialized. Um, however, more and more devices are uh, doing their locking themselves, and then it's left to the device driver to be responsible for making sure it doesn't get confused. So thank you, KVM. That made our life a bit easier. So I'm just going to quickly talk about the current state of the uh, patches, and then we can go to questions. Uh, so I'm going to co cover the state of the various trees, um, how we can approach enabling the features, and finally the state of documentation and testing. So the majority of the, um, the let's talk about the load link store conditional patches. So the majority of this patch set is actually an independent of a multi-threaded TCG uh, implementation, but it's already been through a number of review cycles, and we're hoping to get it merged into the tree fairly soonish. Or, although there is another patch that has just recently appeared on the list that might add to this. Um, the work's been done by Alvis Rigo of Virtual Open Systems, and you'll, if you go to the slides, you can get a, a link to the Git tree. Uh, the multi-threaded TCG patches themselves. Um, Basically, there's a whole number of cleanup and rationalization patches for the existing locking, and that's already starting to get pulled into the maintainer trees for merging into um, master. So the delta for enabling full multi-threaded TCG is reducing quite quickly. 
Uh, the majority of this work has been done by uh, Frederick Conrad from Green Sox, and you can find the code there. Uh, finally, since I last gave this talk at KPM Forum, which was only three weeks ago, there's been another patch set um, posted on the list uh, from Emilio Gotta. Um, it has a couple of interesting ideas, so it's got an alternative approach to doing the load link store conditional um, that aims to reduce the contention that you'd see with the, the TLB regions. And he's also done uh, an example of implementation of uh, barrier semantics, but he's only done it for one of the uh, architectures, I think x86 at the moment. So memory barriers, as I say, is, is an area which is still work in progress. Um, generally, the solutions seem to be talking about using a number of uh, TCG ops to represent memory barriers, but these are very hard things to test. I mean, running on x86, which is the general case for most emulation, you generally don't run into memory barrier issues because the, the memory ordering is so strong compared to the guest it's emulating. Um, currently, all the testing that's been done on multi-threaded TCG has been an ARM32 guest on an x86 backend. But we're aiming to enable um, multi-threaded TCG for all front and back ends. The question is going to be whether or not we can do this in a big bang manner or whether we're going to have to do this back end by back end as support is enabled. Uh, any front end that's going to be usable for multi-threaded TCG will have to start converting its atomic operations to use the new TCG ops. Uh, and for barrier support, back ends will also need to support the TCG ops for doing barriers. Um, finally, uh, we want to improve the testing and documentation of the system. So both are fairly important to have confidence in the design. Uh, we're, we've got a whole number of handwritten torture tests that are used to stress the translation uh, and prove that the uh, thing works well under pressure. Uh, and we also want to have a complete <coughs> reference in the documents directory of how the design for multi-threaded TCG works. And with that, I'm open to any more questions. So when you do a loop and you're, you, you find your basic block, does the basic block allow to stay in the basic block for a loop, or does it have to go between basic block and basic block for each iteration of the loop? Uh, a basic block can loop back on itself. If you you, yeah. Um, how are you going? Where is it? Like that. How are you going to emulate weak memory models? Um, well, when you say emulate weak memory models, we want to make sure that the uh, primitives that weak memory models use to enforce ordering are properly enforced. So when you're running a weak on a weak back end. That's, that's, not, that, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I want to see the failures I see on AR64 uh, under emulation as well, and I don't, because that's one of the worst areas for failures, and it would be really great if I could run it under QEMU, and QEMU put the, the really worst behavior. It, it queued all the stores to the last possible moment in a massive big queue, and only when you actually did a DMB did it say, oh, well, I'll write them all that out now, and then you could really really test the system that you have got all your atomic primitives uh, correct. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, this is one area where you run in, uh, you're running slightly counter to Quemu's overall philosophy. So Quemu's philosophy is it should run reasonably written code reasonably well, and it's not trying to do a perfect architectural simulation. Yeah. Um, I don't see any reason why you, people couldn't come up with uh, a, a, a for, uh, if, if it could be done as a lightweight fork of Quemu to do this sort of um, stress testing, that would be another thing that could be done. But the, the general use case of Quemu is to run reasonable code well, not to, not to, not, not to replace the foundation model. Yes. Yes. yes, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, from that quietness, I'll assume uh, assent. So uh, thank you very much.